Hello, my name is Brian Skelling. I am the APP former international liaison and former president. I am a piercer uh, since the late 80s. I started my first studio in 1992 in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. And now I live in France with my family and continue to teach and work in the piercing related field, both with infection control and material science and a lot about technique, especially needle and sharps handling and safety techniques for sterilization and asepsis. I also work with the Association for Professional Piercers uh, Technology Group and Social Media, and I also work with the American Society for Testing Materials International, which is a standards organization that helps write uh, recipes and guidelines for everything from surgical implant materials to suture needles and hypodermic needles. So uh, the question was posed whether a competent piercer should or should not use one type of sharp or another. Uh, a catheter, cannula type needle, or a common needle blade, uh, both can be used, both could be better or worse quality. Uh, neither will necessarily be the best choice for every single person, especially for those who do not yet use sterile gloves during procedure. A cannula might be a better choice for an aseptic no-touch technique because it has a handle. Uh, however, a piercing blade could be also used with a tool with a handle to put through. The main distinction that I find is simply that the best quality needles and the best quality cannula, catheter needles, have a significant difference in the geometry of the bevel. The point of a needle has a lancet tip, which is one grind that makes a flat edge, and then two more grinds that give a blade to it. This makes a C-shaped cut Whereas a catheter may even have more cuts to grind it to make the tip point directly slightly different versus a needle blade, both of them are going to have at least those three cuts. And so you have a cutting edge that's off center. The difference being that a good quality catheter is going to have an edge that is more abrupt and a good quality piercing needle, needle blade, is going to have a much more tapered angle at the lancet tip. That lancet tip being more tapered goes farther through and exits the other side before it starts to stretch the tissue. And this can minimize the C-shaped cut, so you end up with more of a, a small scar rather than a piece with a flap that's been pushed in. A catheter, it's very difficult to ne negotiate anything but the thinnest tissue without having the heel, the open part of the eye of the needle, this heel start to core or to grab in this tissue. So there's a bit more drag. Same thing goes with any needle at all, whether it be a needle blade or a catheter. If it has a less acute lancet, it's going to have a more difficult, more friction, more drag, more damage, uh, more difficult passage through. So the more acute the angle of the tip is, uh, if you think of it like an Olympic dive, if their arms are out, it makes a big splash. If their arms are at 45 degrees, it makes a bigger splash than if they make a very tight form. The idea with piercing is the same. Less splash you make, less mess. Uh, thanks. Second question about the steel in a total uh, Okay. So, I was asked about jewelry materials and initial piercing jewelry materials you'll find at jewelry.safepiercing.org. Our standards are based on the American Society for Testing and Materials International, ISO as well, and the World Health Organization as well as uh, many national standards institutes have accepted those standards and harmonized them, meaning that the American and the Canadian and the British and the Finnish and the Swedish and the French and the Spanish Russian. and the Russian all agree on the same science. Because the science that's gone to ISO 
is evidence-based. Now, if you want to put a piece of metal in a person's body, you have to make sure that metal is made with the right recipe, with the right ingredients, with the right temperature, does it need to be formed in a vacuum, does it need to be formed uh, at a certain rate, does it need to be annealed, lots of questions that you have to ask, but to start with, there are certain chemistries that are tolerated better than others for the body. Uh, there are known irritants and sensitizers that are in a number of the materials that are currently on use for body jewelry, currently in use for body jewelry, that is, uh, such as nickel, and copper, and cadmium, and lead. There's quite a number of jewelry materials on the market that are being sold as cosmetic or decorative pieces for healed piercings only that would not be acceptable at all for a new or healing piercing because they have irritant properties that would be sensitizing and it could cause an allergic reaction if you were healing with it. But when you have a healed piercing, your body can tolerate it. One of these materials would be stainless steel that is rated for surgical implant. Um, Although people might say that the rules change when a piercing is healed and of course people start playing the game of what can I fit in my piercing, whether it be a big stretch piercing they stick their soda straw through or what have you. Um, we all play silly games and have bad ideas sometimes, but if you're going to put something in your body and leave it for any period of time, you would like to have a known material, not a, a mystery, and you would like to have a predictable response in the body. And this is why, our, why the ISO and ASTM standards are appropriate. There are many standards for stainless steel for engineering. Some are made for corrosion resistance, some are made for strength, some are made for smoothness and shininess. The type of stainless steel that is used for piercing jewelry that is designed to meet the ASTM F138 is acceptable for healed piercings if it has an appropriate surface finish and mechanical properties as well. Chemistry alone isn't uh, particularly wonderful because people who are relatively tolerant can still react to the nickel content because eventually nickel will release from the alloy slowly, uh, but a very sensitive person may still have a problem with any nickel-based alloy. There are other steel alloys that do not contain nickel. Um, mostly they substitute cobalt chrome, for example, but my suspicion is that most people are not going to find much jewelry made of that, with few exceptions of very basic pieces. So I personally stopped using stainless steel jewelry in 1996, because at the time, uh, the regulations changed to the point where we became directly personally responsible in my area where I was working for putting things in people's bodies. So if I was to choose a piece of jewelry and put it in you, I would want the best possible evidence in advance that it was going to not cause you a long-term problem. Because I don't want to be that person that 10 years from now caused you a big lump of scar tissue, desensitization of the body part, or becoming sensitive to nickel. Because for example, once you become sensitive to nickel, your belt buckle or your watch band or any number of other things that we're commonly coming in contact with occasionally can become big irritants. So nickel exposure over a long period of time uh, doesn't make you become more tolerant. It's quite the opposite. It is bit by bit making you less and less tolerant and more and more sensitive. The short answer is that I would not personally put stainless steel in anything other than a fully healed piercing and only for temporary wear for dress up. For example, if I wanted to wear a special pair of plugs today that I could only get made in stainless steel, I would wear them happily for a day. I would not wear them in the shower. I would not wear them to bed. If I did, I probably wouldn't explode. But by choice, I want to limit my exposure to things that I know can cause an irritation or a sensitization in the long run. Titanium uh, to F136 or titanium to F67 ASTM standard are both ones that are made for permanent surgical implant that have much less likelihood to irritate or cause allergic reactions.
And about the taking care of the uh, different okay. tariffs. Yeah. Okay, so. In, in what particular? In what particular that uh, in Russia everyone have the different uh, opinion on this uh, question. Right. So uh, uh, I'm like a master. I recommend only salt water, and uh, from but time why? to time, because the, it's pH pH neutral. But why does it need to be pH neutral? So sorry. But why does it need to be pH neutral? Uh, why is it? Need? Why does it need to be pH neutral? Uh, to against the tissue swollen and going to the uh, drying or something. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, what is the what is the rationale behind using salt water? Uh, what 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 is your reason for using salt water or saline? Because <clears throat> uh, everyone else using the I don't know uh, chlorgic sedenium. Sure. Perhaps yeah, you know it's uh, too hot for the tissue. Yes, in fact, yes. uh, especially for the for the oral, for oral. If you do it every day, you uh, we we used to find people who used hippocrines uh, yeah. surgical scrub on their navel piercings that would have the skin eaten away around the piercing, would dangle it around the middle. Um, okay, so I'll I'll address this in one simple realm. When it comes to wound care, there is a branch of medical science devoted to wound care that has been specialized in wound care for more than 100 years. It's interdisciplinary between clinical microbiologists, histologists, um, and clinical care providers, and many, many other uh, stakeholders in it, uh, including people who make products that they want to sell. Bear in mind that many companies want to sell you a lot of different things. They want to sell you germ killing products. My question is, do we need to kill the germs? Maybe. I personally feel that if I get something dirty, I will want to wash it. Right? That, I think that's a fair thing to say. If I scrape my knee, it's an accident. Mm -hmm. um, I want the dirt to get out of my skin. <laughs> wash it with soap and water at a minimum. Perhaps I would use an antiseptic product at that point. Um, judiciously. And I probably would not repeatedly wash that wound with an antiseptic product unless there were signs of infection and I was instructed to do so by a wound care professional. Um, antiseptic care is kind of a low level response. That's something that would generally happen in an accident situation. Uh, that's first aid uh, or um, trauma care. We're not creating a wound under anything other than uh, controlled circumstances. I mean, this is not an accident. We're not blindfolded with a blowgun. Um, we're not falling on a thorn and then saying, hey, that's a cool place. I want to put jewelry in it. Um, we are specifically doing something to break the skin on someone's body for fun. So it is in our entire responsibility to focus on the interest of the person getting it done. Our interest is making a living but also having a good reputation so we can make a living for a very long time. And the core of that is a consistent asepsis so that every single person walking out of the studio has no more danger than if they were to get uh, an injection from the physician or have their blood drawn properly by someone who actually cleans their hands and doesn't touch the tip of the needle and doesn't palpate after washing your skin. Yeah. Again, it is your job as a professional who understands asepsis to call that out <laughs> amongst your colleagues and also think through your process yourself. If we, my position I posit is, if we are capable of providing this fun service in a way that's entertaining and safe aseptically, we are aseptic, meaning not introducing any septic fomites or, or bugs. Basically, we're not putting monsters in people's bodies that will then try to eat them. Right? These little invisible monsters that are microscopic microbes that hurt things. If we can just simply not put them in there in the first place and educate our customers not to put any there on their own, hand washing is the number one thing for our customer education. Teach them to wash their hands before they even think about their piercing. <laughs> and then if they're going to touch their piercing, to touch it with something that is sterilized. They want to wipe the dried crust off their piercing because 
it's about to fall off or it's stuck and it hurts, um, at that point, they could use a sterile saline. Uh, for example, they could pop open a small saline ampoule and spread that on a sterile gauze pad with their freshly washed hands and wipe it off. Or better yet, they use something with a handle, a sterile swab, that way they don't touch the cotton bud, and wipe it off. The downside of the cotton swabs is the fibers can get tangled in the piercing uh, smaller than the visible eye. So, it's even better just not to touch the piercing at all. Only clean the area with a uh, soap or antiseptic product if it gets handled or damaged, slept on, etc. And focus on educating your clients hand washing first because that's the number one reason touch and transfer surfaces are where the germs are going to be picked up and the transient germs go and they may, it may not even be germs that would otherwise bother intact skin. It may be a commensal, something that normally lives on your skin, but if you put enough of them on the bus and then drive the bus into the tunnel, <laughs> they can uh, start uh, deciding that it's a snack bar and eating you. So hand washing and asepsis are the A number one and uh, focus of my uh, aftercare suggestions. Um, using only sterilized things to touch the piercing while it's healing, uh, sterile bandage if possible, uh, something that's breathable so it doesn't mm -hmm. stay in how, much, well, how much of these? Until it stops producing a scab. Your body tries to form a scab to seal yep. up most piercings if it can. I recommend that people do not wash them off. I treat piercings like wound care professionals treat a clean elective surgery. Uh, say for example, if uh, we were going to do a surgery to um, open up your skin, put something underneath, what have you, it's an elective surgery where they're going to do a brow lift or any, any other minor thing. When they open it, they do it under properly clean conditions with only sterilized equipment and with the appropriate cautions conscientiously not to introduce bugs to the body. Say, for example, they close a elective procedure with stitches. This is, of course, making comparisons. This is not trauma. This is not a person who fell on their knee and needs the dirty wound stitched back up. That needs antiseptic care and perhaps an antibiotic prophylaxis. This is a wound that is created by choice, carefully, and closed. Now that wound is not going to require a lot of effort afterwards compared to the knee that broke open and was contaminated and had to be closed. It really only needs to be protected, meaning that you don't put anything dirty in contact with it, don't sleep on it, don't let your shower or your bath uh, flow over it. You, for example, your new nipple piercing, you don't want to wash your deodorant down <laughs> in your nipple. Um, that's amazing. That's so many people, their nipple piercings are irritated and um, when they just learn to wash their deodorant to the side instead of down over the nipple, magically the chemical reaction goes away. Um, so that's the thing. Asepsis also means consciously realizing that other things can wash in the area. It could be germs, it could be an irritant chemical, I mentioned. Um, but really, the big issue is touch and transfer, hands, people who want to pick and move things around. And the other side of it is uh, chemicals. Some people want to buy an antiseptic and put it on there every single day because they think they need it. Sorry, there's no close through. I must hear. It's a close through. Um, the, the idea that you need to put an antiseptic on it really isn't isn't very forward thinking. It's um, it's overkill in a sense yep. that safely smell the odor you. Overkill is good if you Presume that there are germs that you need to fight and you use something that kills more than what you presume might be there. In the situation of trauma, that makes sense. We take an antibiotic that goes through the whole system so we don't have to worry about loose bugs in the blood. We don't want septicemia. Um, and of course, we may put a cream or gel or some sort of antibiotic or antiseptic on the trauma. For piercing though, we are not doing piercings without except without protective precautions to avoid that. So we don't need that kind of protective aftercare afterwards that requires chemical cleaning or uh, antibiotic to fight something. Basically, if we don't put bugs in them 
They don't have to kill the bugs. The ones that live on their body, the ones that are commensal, are fine. Your body's microbiome can fight those off. In fact, they don't have to fight, they just live there. <laughs> um, really often, uh, aftercare in uh, North of Russia is just uh, put the antibi antibiotic cream on a fresh... So I would, I would, uh, it's very common in the US too and all over for people to just put, let's say, your Neosporin or polymyxin B sulfate or something like that. My suggestion simply is to think about why you're making that mess. Are you doing a contaminated procedure? Do you feel like you must use some sort of prophylaxis afterwards because the person is not educated well enough to keep their person protected? Are you telling your client by telling them to use this germ-killing product that they're not going to follow your instructions? You don't believe that they would follow your instructions if you educated them? I think most people who get a piercing are willing to go through whatever process is necessary within reason to protect the piercing after the fact and will be more likely to comply when it doesn't require uh, purchasing a product and repeatedly uh, applying it. Uh, it's easier to protect something in the first place than it is to clean things up after it gets dirty. So, 